help bolster the league after the defection of three key schools to the ACC. Cincinnati, Louisville, and South Florida will join the Big East in 2005-2006, while Marquette and DePaul will come aboard for all sports except football. Characterized as victims in the ACC situation, Big East Commissioner Mike Trangizi says both the Big East and Conference USA are victors today. Conference USA saw this as an opportunity to reconfigure itself as a pure 1A Southern-based football playing conference. And, and they were able to do that. So when we saw that we might be able to fill our needs and they at the same time could do the same thing and we would not have to reach out to other conferences and be disruptive. To me, it was, it, was the, it, was the, it was the best choice that we could possibly make. The Big East will actually expand to a 16-team basketball conference starting in 2005. Big East now boasts seven different teams that have won at least one NCAA tournament and a total of nine. Cincinnati and Louisville alone combined for four national championships and 13 Final Fours. Bring in the head coach, the 16th ranked Louisville Cardinals. That's Rick Pitino. Do you feel like your career has come full circle? You started out as an assistant coach with Jim Beheim at Syracuse. And we're now we're back in the Big East. We joined Conference USA trying to experience new things, and it's come full circle, and we're right back where we started. Can a conference be too big, Rick? Well, I... I think in terms, uh, we really don't know. To answer it quite honestly, I, I really don't know. I do know that it will be the strongest conference in the history of basketball from a, a depth standpoint. I, I've never seen anything like it. It's going to be so much competition that it's, it's going to be a dogfight from the first conference game all the way to the end. But as far as having teams and trying to build rivalries, you have geographical barriers here. You lose a little bit of that intimacy of what the Big East used to be. How do you overcome those barriers? Well, I think those days are, are gone. I think that's uh, the leagues now, it's all about consolidation, taking over another company, taking over this company, and, and forming these big superpowers. And I think that's what you have right now. I think Mike Trangizi's done a wonderful job to preserve the elite status of the Big East, as well as Conference USA has sort of built a, a group of teams now that geographically can work together and be, be more of a Southwest-type flavor. How does this affect your recruiting, the fact that you won't be joining this conference in a couple of years? Well, it really doesn't, it really doesn't affect us too much. We, we're having an outstanding recruiting season this year, but we recruit the Northeast very hard, and obviously this is going to add to that, playing the conference tournament at Madison Square Garden and building the rivalries in certain big cities where the media obviously is located, like Chicago and New York and, and the New England area. It's only going to enhance uh, our exposure to recruit nationally, which is something we've already done in the past. Do you blame the fact that college football doesn't have a playoff system and that's why we have conference reshuffling? No question about it. I don't understand football as, uh, like most experts do, but why they don't have a Final Four and get down to eight teams or four teams and having a true national champion. Now, we all know right now that, that Oklahoma is number one, but if there were three or four undefeated teams, you really don't understand that system, and uh, it would be much better if they had a basketball format. How would you feel if the BCS governed college basketball? Oh, I'd, I'd probably, I said I'd never go back to pro basketball, but I'd probably apply <laughs> somehow to one of the teams. <laughs> Big East uh, will be the best basketball conference in your mind? From a depth standpoint, I've never seen, since I've been a coach, which is now 30 years, I've never seen anything like this. It's, it's almost scary to, to think about the competition. Uh, we're bringing to the table programs li like Cincinnati, Marquette, who's riding a huge wave right now, South Florida, who's an up-and-coming team, and as well as DePaul, and then you put together those traditional schools, adding Notre Dame as well as the nucleus to the Big East, and it's a, it's a scary league, to say the least. Are you concerned, though, as a coach, that you will beat up on each other before you even get to the tournament? No doubt about it. I mean, that's, that's the thing you fear the most, but that type of... Com I've always believed that great competition brings out the best. And what, what it's going to take for every basketball team is to have great bench support so that doesn't happen. But I, you, you can't look at the Big East right now and say, where is there an easy game? Where can you look on the schedule and say, okay, we, we've got a W. That happens in every league. That will not happen in the Big East. When you look at what this means for you right now and, and the coaching job you have, you love the fact Conference USA coaches point to you and say, well, Louisville's the team to beat this year? Well, I don't, I don't think we are. I think that 
in the Conference USA, no one knows who's really good this year. We've all lost so much. We've lost Reese Gaines and Marvin Stone, and, and Marquette's lost Wade, and every team has lost a lot. So at Conference USA this year, there's tremendous parity, and I don't think anybody realizes uh, who, who the best is. We're going to have to show it on the court. All right, Rick, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Dan. All right, Rick Pitino, head coach of the 16th-ranked Louisville Cardinals. Coming up on Sports Center, when the game's on the line, few coaches have for Miami, Virginia. Right. It is without question Beck's best. Mark Messier's family in the building, plus the son, as it would have it, Mark Howe of Gordy Howe. He was scouting for the Detroit Red Wings. Now the Rangers can get onto the business of playing the way they've been playing lately and just enjoy that they still have Mark Messier on their team. He, by the way, leads the Rangers in scoring this season. As for our topic B tonight, the change of the Big East. Announced today by Big East Commissioner Mike Trangizi that the Big East would field one amazing basketball conference and one, well, questionable football conference. This after a raid by the ACC. We go 360 degrees inside the story of the remake of the Big East Conference. Heinrich starts inside, goes outside, Heinrich gets it, Heinrich puts up the shot, it's too long, and Syracuse is your national champion. The defending national champion Syracuse Orange Men return to play basketball and are joined by top-ranked UConn. After that, the story of the Big East basketball look changes by including Bob Huggins and his Cincinnati Bearcats. Include in the mix also Rick Pitino and Louisville, and things start to get extremely interesting. And then there's Marquette. All they did was last year go to the Final Four. Included in the mix, DePaul and South Florida. Wow. Basketball speaks for itself. I mean, 14 of our 16 teams have played in the Final Four. I think another seven have won national championships. The football side, we've, we're going to take our old formula, work hard and go play people. But we think we have programs with a huge upside. Uh, South Florida comes from uh, an area that has great football players, and now that they, they, have, they have elevated to competing in a league like this, they're going to be able to recruit better players. Cincinnati came within a play of beating Ohio State last year. Louisville's gone to five straight bowl games. And just in this league, Connecticut joins us next year. Uh, they, they're not even officially, they, they're, they're just, they're now just becoming a 1A school and they already have eight wins. And Greg Schiano's doing a great job at Rutgers. I mean, he's had a hard task uh, in front of a big challenge. And all of a sudden, here's Rutgers 4-4 four four, getting ready to play important football games in November. This is a great day for the Big East because we've been able to achieve some things to make our conference stronger for the future. Uh, you know, as the college landscape changes we have to change to adapt it and the process that we undertook which was deliberate and involved the presidents forced us all to bond together in a way that uh, we never did before the Big East is unique it is the only conference of the big six if you will of the BCS conferences that has institutions like Seton Hall and Rutgers or excuse me St. John's and uh, uh, Villanova Georgetown Providence that don't play football. To satisfy everyone, we would have had to, uh, Notre Dame would have had to agree to come into the conference. Penn State would have had to come, agree to come into the conference. And we all know neither one of those is going to happen or will ever happen. Um, but I think people will understand as we work our way through this and, and, and we, we are not going to deliver a results in the next two years. What he's talking about is Big East football, losing powerhouses Miami and Virginia Tech to the ACC. What does that do to BCS ball hopes for the Big East teams that are left? We still have three more years to go on the current BCS agreement, and we don't even know what the next BCS agreement is going to look like, but we still are one of the six best conferences in, in, in America. We've got teams that have won national championships, teams that have produced Heisman Trophy winners, and we've been a good partner, and we're, we're confident that whatever the uh, plan is, whether it's the BCS or some other configuration, we'll be around the table with the other five conferences. And now joining us to explain what all this means is a man who's covered the Big East Conference since day one, Tom Lucci of the Star Ledger. Tom, make sense of all this for me. It seems as though the Big East now has as good a basketball conference in the country. 
Yeah, uh, uninspiring uh, football, probably with a lot of upside. So there's no marquee team, really, marquee teams in there. But the, the best basketball league in the country, without question. I don't, I don't even think it's open to debate at this point. When you add, uh, you know, schools like Marquette, Cincinnati, and Louisville to the basketball side, DePaul, too, is, is a solid basketball program. All right, now on the football side, what is this conference going to feel like? We're going to put up the teams that are in it. It's Rutgers, Pittsburgh, West Virginia, Syracuse, Connecticut, Cincinnati, South Florida, and Louisville. And one of the schools that everybody's been sort of wondering about because they've so dramatically improved their program is Connecticut. Can they be satisfied with this long term? Uh, I think they can because if you look at that league, the one thing about it is there's more co it's more competitive, there's more balance. Anybody has a chance to win that league in 2005, including Connecticut, which is 7-3 and three this year going into the game against Rutgers. What it gives Connecticut is an entree into the BCS because uh, assuming the Big East holds on to its automatic BCS bid, all of those schools, which a lot of them haven't had a chance to get into the BCS mix, are in it. Louisville was not in it. Uh, again, South Florida wasn't in it. The BCS mix is the mix of teams that are, are allowed to play for the major well, bowl games. Well, right now it's the six major conferences and, the, and two out-large bids. Yes, the champions of six major conferences and two at-large bids. We don't know what the BCS will look like in three years when the new contract comes up, but uh, for now, the, the Big East is grandfathered in under that, so the Big East champion the next uh, three years is going to go to a BCS game. And how do they view the seriousness of a Big East schedule? I mean, if UConn, let's say, is 8-3, and three, is that a legit 8-3? and three? Well, I think, yeah, I think these are solid, you know, again, Louisville's a solid football program. I think Pittsburgh's good. Uh, Rutgers seems to be improving. Uh, Syracuse has a national reputation. It's not going to be a problem. It's, uh, the strength of schedule in the league won't be a problem. It's just, it's the absence of marquee schools. When you lose a, a Miami, a perennial top 10 team, and you lose a Virginia Tech, which is just right on the cusp of being an annual top 10 team, it's really a blow to the league in terms of marquee schools. That's what they lack right now, and that's where Connecticut has to pick it up. Rutgers has to pick it up. Louisville has to continue to be good. South Florida, everybody says it's tremendous growth potential. Pittsburgh has to be real good. You know, they just, everybody has to get better. All right, we're going to take a look at the list of teams as we go back to the basketball story because it is a, it is a who's who of basketball to a large degree. Rutgers, Pittsburgh, West Virginia, Syracuse, Connecticut, Cincinnati, South Florida, Louisville, Georgetown, Providence, Notre Dame, Villanova, Seton Hall, St. John's, Marquette, and DePaul. Now, the uh, ACC has long prided itself on being the, the top basketball conference in America. Can they still say that? Absolutely not. And the irony is they're not because they, they took football schools from the Big East. That's what I'm saying. It's to, crazy. Right. You know, to enhance their football image, they took football schools from the Big East, and now they've watered down their basketball because if you look this year, Miami and Virginia Tech will be picked at the bottom of the Big East, 13th and 14th probably. They're going to the ACC for basketball as well, which people forget. Now, you know, it's going to water down the, the, the RPI and the ACC for basketball. Some people will say, wait a minute now, the Big East was all upset that they got raided by the ACC. How's this different? Well, I, I think the process is, was different because I think uh, the Big East was very above board. And if you look at, uh, you know, the way that the Big East went about this, the way that they handled it, uh, I think it was a little more, a lot more ethical than the way the ACC went about this. Where does this all leave St. John's? It leaves St. John's in a position where uh, their, their home schedule for your St. John's fans is going to be much, much uh, better because you're losing potentially Miami and Virginia Tech, and you have a chance now to bring uh, Louisville and Cincinnati into the Garden almost every year or every other year. Uh, you know, St. John's is going to have to pick it up recruiting. I don't think there's any question because you can have a very good team in this reconfigured Big East in 2005 and finish ninth because there's a chance seven or eight schools are going to the NCAA tournament from the Big East in, in 2005. Where do all the lawsuits stand between the ACC and, and the Big East? Well, everything's still pending. And as a matter of fact, that's one of the lawsuits that's holding up the Big East is BC. We don't know, nobody knows what they're going to do yet, whether they're going to be in the, in the league next year for one more year, uh, play another lame duck season, or whether they're going to be out after to this season. We don't know that. That's still being decided by the courts. Have we left anything out that's important in your eyes? Well, the, yeah, the important thing is the, key, the entire key to the Big East future is whether they maintain and retain that automatic BCS uh, bid. Uh, that's a $14 million question. That's what it's worth for every conference. And uh, we won't know that until they begin negotiating the new contract, which everybody says will be probably next year. But it sounds like, to me, I find it very difficult to believe they're not going to have Northeast representation in the BCS mix. I, I, I just, I can't believe they're going to shut out the Big East. Tom, as always, great information. Thanks, Al. Tom Lucci covers the Big East for the Star Ledger. When we come back and around the corner, Fooch weighs in on the Yankees dipping into their rich past to pull out Don Mattingly as their new hitting coach. This is Angles presented by Bex. First quarter, Sam Cassell gets it in to Kevin Garnett and check this move out. Up and in. How did he do that? And the foul. Garnett not even looking at the basket, but that's what happens when you're an all-star, I guess. Soon after, Knicks try to work some magic of their own. Howard Isley ahead to Mutombo. Dikembe scores the bucket and the foul. And after the made free throws, the Knicks led 16-14. As for Sprewell, not a good night.
trying to find some room with Allen Houston defending him. Sprewell missed all four of his field goal attempts in the first half, finished with five total points in the ball game. Second quarter, Knicks add to their lead. Charlie Ward gets to Allen Houston. He swings it over to Mutombo, and the big fella hits the jumper. Mutombo finished with 18 points, 17 rebounds. In fact, 17 of his 18 came in the first half, including this little hook shot, and the Knicks had a 48-39 lead at halftime. Third quarter, ball sent to Shandon Anderson. He misses the jumper. Kevin Garnett gets it. Ahead to Sam Cassell, who gets it out to Trenton Hassel. He takes it in, and the T-Wolves were back within a bucket, 51-49. Later on, it's Cassell bringing it into the front court. Then he takes it into the paint, keeping it himself with a little floater. It's still a two-point game, but Minnesota's on top now after 369-67. Fourth quarter, Garnett gets by Clarence Weatherspoon, then throws it down. Minnesota went up by as many as nine in the fourth quarter, but the Knicks fight back. And with under five minutes left, Freewell would drive and miss. Frank Williams goes the other way. He had a career-high 17 points, but this time he gave it up to Allen Houston, who hits the jumper, and the game was tied at 84. Under two minutes left, it's Houston again. What bad back? Sprewell defending him. Houston, no problem. Still drains the shot, and the Knicks were up 90 to 87. It's a two-point lead under 30 seconds left off the screen. Houston all alone. His foot's just on a three-point line, so it's only a two-pointer, but that's enough to send him into thrills, and why not? The Knicks get their third straight win, second straight on the road, 97-92. And the third straight win, something they did only three times all last year, and here are the fourth quarter numbers, pertinent ones. Allen Houston, 13 of his 17 points in the fourth quarter. Knicks finished on a 22-8 run. They made their last seven field goals, shot 52% for the game. Far cry from Sprewell, who was two for 11 in 37 minutes. Back-to-back -back road wins, something they did only four other times under Don Chaney, who is quite happy at what he's seen. Someone asked a couple of months ago about how long would it take before this team kind of gel. I, I still think, I still believe we have adjustments to make, but I think the guys who are playing are starting to find out a little bit about each other and feel comfortable with each other, and we have to continue to, to play together, and that's what we're doing. Really sweet, feels good. You know, I don't, can't remember the last time we've won three in a row, and just, you know, the way everybody's um, <clears throat> Just playing. Everybody's playing together, and everybody's playing it's tough defense. Um, you know, right now I think you know we're, we're a team that just is never out of the game. It's been a while since we got back to back game, uh, got back to back win on the road, and I don't remember the last time we did it. So, by having something like this happening to us, it make everyone feel good, especially when you're on your road for three games and uh, you win your first two, you feel very good. Even though we miss our turkey tomorrow, but <laughs> you know I love Matumbo, but I always wonder what he sounds like when he's got a sore throat. <laughs> can, uh, can you tell the difference? Definitely can't tell at all. Now, and good time for the Knicks to start playing well. They face the best team in the NBA Thursday night in Indiana. Some important late breaking baseball news. It appears the New York Mets have signed Japanese shortstop Kaz Matsui. That, according to various reports out of Tokyo. The official announcement should come at about 1.30 a.m. in a news conference in Japan. It's a reported three year deal worth $20 million. Looks like the Mets have landed one of Japan's best. All right, now on to football. The Jets' dreams of making 28 year old Japanese switch inning shortstop Kaz Matsui. No relation to Hideki. Matsui arrived at JFK tonight, met by Jeff Wilpon, General Manager Jim Duquette, Vice President of Media Relations Jay Horowitz. Matsui will bat leadoff. Jose Reyes will move to second base. Bartolo Colon is close. Matsui comes to the Mets with a big league reputation. According to scouts, he's faster than Ichiro, can hit the ball to all fields, gold glove. Some pop, hits for average, and he was pursued by three other teams earlier in the year. The Angels, Dodgers, and Yankees showed interest, but when it came time to pony up the cash, the Mets stood alone. The Mets gave him flowers when he arrived at JFK. His contract, a no-trade deal, allows him to become a free agent in 2006. In Japan, they called him Little Matsui, 5'10", 175 pounds, Matsui claims that the Mets made him feel most wanted. Matsui says he's not concerned about the numbers he puts up. 
His major goal in the major leagues is to play every game. The Mets feel that Matsui is a rare talent with power, speed, and great defense up the middle. And that's why he is now the New York Mets' new shortstop, although he claims he'll play anywhere they ask him. But he's the new shortstop because the Mets have already asked Jose Reyes to move over to second base. The Mets uh, made a couple of moves today. Anybody wants in, get in. Anybody wants out, can get out. Okay? This team is going to the playoffs. Wasn't that long ago, was it? Dan Reeves went to his owner and said, if you're going to fire me at the end of the year, tell me with three games left and I'll bounce out now. Jim Fossil went to his owner and said, if you're going to fire me at the end of the season, tell me with two games left and I'll try like heck to win the last two before I go. It's a different approach, but the one Fossil takes. After seven years at the helm, Fossil fired. Giants have lost six straight. The third winningest coach in franchise history figures time for a change after the last two games. Being the head coach of seven years in New York is a, is a very long term. And I know that because there's only three guys that have held their job longer than me in this, in this league. And that speaks volumes as far as what this league is about right now. You do as much as you can, as fast as you can, and you know that there's a day going to come where uh, it's not going right. And this has been a bad season. It's been a very disappointing season, and I feel that deeply. And uh, so I think it's time for them. They need a change. I need a change. And I think it's the right thing to do. He's a great coach, man. He's a dear friend of mine, and he always will be. Um, it's going to be hard for playing someone else, but uh, like he said, it's, um, you know, maybe change is good. You know, maybe it's time for uh, something to change around here. I told you Giants have lost six straight. They've been outscored by over 110 points in those six. They've committed 10 more turnovers than their opponents. Sean Salisbury, work the microphone and break this decision down. First and foremost, Jim Fossil will be a head football coach somewhere else in 2004. I guarantee it. Now, if I was Mr. Mara, first guy I'd hire is Jimmy Johnson. I'd offer him five million bucks. I'd put a boat in the Long Island Harbor. I'd let him fish during the football season. I'd let him go out and get his assistance, and I'd make it too impossible for him to turn down. With Jimmy's ego, the fact that he put fear in players, the fact that he's got a winning tradition and knows how to turn a team around, and plus the cupboard's not bare in New York with a top 10 pick, Go out and get Jimmy Johnson and allow that ego to stick something in the Dallas Cowboys. If that's my choice, Jimmy Johnson's the first one. He's my coach in New York in 2004. Thanks a lot, Sean. Jim Fossil has led the Giants three playoff appearances and a trip to Super Bowl 35. But he's not led the G-Men to back-to-back -back winning seasons in his seven years. And that seven-year streak of no back-to-back -back winning seasons tied for the third longest by a coach with one team in NFL history. Meanwhile, one guy staying put, Brett. Finish out the season as a New York Giants head coach. But today it was officially announced that he will be fired after the final game of the year. Now, this is the same man that led the Giants to the playoffs three of the past seven years, including a Super Bowl appearance just three seasons ago. But oh, how quickly things can change. This year, things have gone downhill in a hurry, and losing six straight ball games just doesn't cut it in New York. This has been a bad season. It's been a very disappointing season. And I feel that deeply. And uh, so I think it's time for them. They need a change. I need a change. And I think it's the right thing to do. The way Jim handled it, I think, was perfect. I think it's very apropos for the kind of person he is and the way that he respects this organization and the, the kind of respect that this organization gives him. It's going to be hard for playing someone else. But uh, like he said, it's, um, you know, maybe change is good. You know, maybe it's time for uh, something to change around here. All right, now to the Yankees. Tonight, it's a fire. No one would have thought that this would have happened the way it happened on the day it happened, but indeed, the Knicks' search for respectability resulted in some upheaval at the top, Kurt. Yeah, I tell you, John, throughout the weekend, speculation ran rampant that Scott Layden was going to fire Don Chaney as the Knicks' head coach. Little did we know that if Layden called Chaney into his office Monday morning, it was indeed to say goodbye, but because he himself was leaving. Layden fired his president and general manager of the Knicks after four plus seasons, the last two without the playoffs, and replaced by Isaiah Thomas. Thomas, who was on the beach because he'd been fired this summer as head coach of the Indiana Pacers, admitted at his introductory press conference that he still wants to coach, but for now at least, has accepted the role as president of basketball operations for the Knicks. His first task, to find out whether or not the current group of players have what it takes to mentally be a championship team. As an athlete and as a, as a competitor in this business, you can never have the mindset uh, of settling for second because if you're going to settle for second, then you're going to be second. 
and the only mindset that you can go into any type of competitive environment with is to win it and to win it all. And right now, I don't know if that's the mindset of the individuals or the team that we have. Uh, I will assess that. I know Isaiah, his goal is, is to win the championship, and I hope we win the championship this year. <laughs> the, um, the, the, uh, um, but the, the, the floor for us is making the playoffs. We, we need to and must make the playoffs. The, um, the, the, uh, this was the thing that we thought would most help us get there. Now, Thomas comes to the job with executive experience, although not all of it's successful. He was the president of the NBA Players Association, then part owner and VP of basketball operations with the expansion Toronto Raptors. Most recently, Thomas was the majority owner of the ultimately doomed Continental Basketball Association. Uh, shortly after Monday's announcement, our Mike Breen sat down for a rundown of Thomas the GM's immediate to-do list. Well, the first thing I need to do is, um, you know, clear the clouds that surround our team. Uh, right now, it's a, a very turbulent atmosphere that's around our coaches and our players. And no one can really perform at their highest levels when that type of atmosphere exists. My job right now is to come in and make sure I give Don all the resources that he needs to succeed and inspire and motivate the players and the coaching staff so they can go out and perform with a great deal of confidence, with no holes barred attitude, knowing that management is solidly behind them. Uh, this is not the type of environment that you can really evalu evaluate properly. This is a type of environment that you make mistakes in because everything is uncertain right now and you don't have players and coaches competing and playing at their, at their max. So this is the time where you can come in and really assess the situation and look at it and make a mistake. However, uh, um, you know, from an evaluation standpoint, if you can come in and get your work done quickly, um, you know, you can go out and, and give the players and the coaches what they need and fix the team if it needs fixing. When you sit down with John Chaney for the first time face to face, if you haven't done it already, what's your message to him? <laughs> just what I t just what I said to you, and also try to assess how he feels about his team, and um, you know see where he's coming from, and see if I can help him, uh, and if he needs immediate help. Uh, can I do that for him? If it's a long-term fix, uh, can I do that for him? But the first thing I need to do is assess uh, where he's at and figure out from him what he needs or what he thinks he needs. You look at players, I'm sure you're going to talk to players as well. What type of player, this might be a little overly generic to answer, but what type of player are you looking for to achieve that ultimate goal that you've talked about? I think any time you, you talk about winning an NBA championship, uh, you got to A, have competitive people and you got to have people who are willing to go to the wall and willing to risk themselves mentally and physically to get there. And then there's a skill set that comes along with that. Uh, if you can put the skill set along with those three things, uh, then you got a chance to go out and win. And, you know, when you get to the championship, you need a little luck. You need Shaq to kind of hurt his toe or something. <laughs> Well, any time a team hasn't made the playoffs in two seasons and is off to a 10 and 18 start in the current year, it's not unheard of to have changes in the organization. But for it to happen this high at the top, you have to wonder whether or not some of the Nick players feel responsible or, like the rest of us, are even surprised by the move. Well, it's kind of shocking. I mean, to hear that you know one of the the persons you know, who has so much of an influence on your organization is is, is gone. Um, but you know, in our business. It could be a player, it could be a coach, it could be, you know, someone such as Scott. I think that, you know, you just look at the team's record and, um, you know, they, management probably feels like they have to shake things up. Um, you know, it's, uh, you know, it's never just one person to blame. You know, it's uh, a whole group of people. Um, you know, who have to look at themselves. It all falls on the players. I mean, you know, uh, we are their plan. So, I mean, you know, uh, the responsibility ultimately is ours. You know, sometimes, you know, uh, the player's not always the one, you know, get to take the hit. He's a very respectable person. Uh, he was honest, he was upfront. Um, uh, and I believe that uh, for Mr. Dolan to bring in someone such as Isaiah, I think he believes, definitely believes that Isaiah is going gonna, is gonna to help. Do you take responsibility, you and your teammates, for what just happened? No, why would we? No. 
I mean, the onus always eventually goes back to the players. Do you guys feel some responsibility for the fact that, that he's gone? No. No. All right, we'll have plenty more on this headline. I'm always fascinating. A position Thomas can no longer fill better than one of his players. Stephon Marbury headed back home to New York City, part of a huge trade with the Phoenix Suns that will send Antonio McDice back to the desert. The eight-player, two-draft pick deal is not a talent-for-talent -talent swap by any means. Nick